بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا صدق الله العظيم We continue with the series of the lecture about family life in Islam. Okay, now I will turn to um, a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam regarding um, the birth of uh, a child and from the birth we want to move on to the necessary things that we need to do uh, with the child once the child is born. We have a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu and it is transmitted by it has been transmitted by Ibn Abu Dunya and uh, the sanad or the chain has been is a good chain Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said inna lil mar'ati fi hamliha ila wadi'aha from the time from the moment a woman conceives a child till the time she gives birth to the child ila fisaliha until the time she weans the child she gets the reward now this is her reward kal mutashahhid fi sabilillah like a mujahid or one who is struggling in the path of Allah. Just as a man who struggles in the path of Allah, he gets his reward, the woman gets her reward, because it's a, it's a great burden to conceive a child, nine months pregnancy, then to give birth to that child. I mean, you ask any woman who has gone through the process, for her it's the greatest um, effort that she has ever, ever or the great, greatest thing she can uh, strive for, uh, and the greatest burden she can carry. And the Prophet ﷺ says, this is her reward. فَإِنْ هَلَكَتْ فِي مَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ If the woman happens to die فِي مَا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ At any moment of that stage when she has conceived the child, when she gives birth or up till she weans the child فَلَهَا أَجْرُ شَهِيد Then she gets the ajr and the reward of a shaheed, of a martyr. And this is something for women to look at and to tie their souls because a lot of the times women think that, well, men have taken all the reward and we have been left behind. Uh, we have a quotation of Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. Um, he is a, a sahabi, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, لِلْحَامِلِ مِنَ الْأَجْرِ أَجْرُ الْعَابِدِ الصَّائِمِ الْمُخْبِتِ الْمُجَاهِدِ For a woman who, who has a child and who carries a child in her womb, she has the reward of a servant of Allah who, who fasts who is obedient to Allah and who is striving in his pathway as well. فَإِذَا ضَرَبَهَا الطَّلْقِ فَلَا يَدْرِ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْخَلَائِقِ مَا لَهَا مِنَ الْأَجْرِ When the child inside her, her womb kicks or causes some suffering or pain, then she has such reward that none of the creation that Allah has created can, can even contemplate or even to think uh, of what, what reward Allah will give. Give. وَإِنْ أَرْضَعَتْ فَلَهَا بِكُلِّ رَضْعَةً When she when she gives milk to the child and breastfeeds the child, for every drop that she feeds feeds the child, for every suckling that she gives to the child, عِقْهُ رَقَبَةً She gets the reward of freeing a a, a slave. وَصِيَامُ سَنَةً And she gets the reward of uh, fasting for a whole year. Now this is the, this is the the uh, quotation of a Sahabi, not of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but Maybe he has heard this, we cannot say he has for definite, maybe he has heard this from the Prophet or maybe um, he, he, he has some other um, um, source where he has, maybe from another Sahabi he has heard this, Allahu Alam. We move on, once the child has, uh, well, when it comes to the, to the child being born, we have a hadith in Ahmad, and this is a hadith that has been practiced by a lot of the Sahabas, a lot of Sahabas have practiced the hadith and also it's narrated by um, uh, Abdullah ibn Ahmad. Um, Ahmad ra- rahimahullah, he has, he has placed it in his book. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah has also placed it in his book of Fatawa. Ibn Al-Qayyim al jawziyah has also narrated from this. So we can see that th- there's no bid'ah regarding this hadith. 
Abdullah ibn, ibn Ahmad, Abdullah the son of Ahmad says that I saw my father, Yaktubu lil mar'ah, I saw him write, and this is again, um, I'll give you the chain of this hadith. My father Ahmad rahimahullah, he would write for a woman, إِذَا asura عَلَيْهَا وِلَادَتُهَا fi jamin abyad. When, when the child or the, or the bearing of a child would become difficult for a woman or the days of labor would draw, draw near, he would, he would write this in a, a white uh, bowl, or shay in nazif or something clean, yaktubu haditha ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He would write the hadith of ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. So it is not Ahmad rahimahullah who is just doing this. He's taking from ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He would write, la ilaha illallahu al-halimul kareem. Subhanallah rabbil arsh al-azim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. كأنهم يوم يرون ما يوعدون لن يلبثوا إلا ساعة من نهار بلاغ and then he would write وكأنهم يوم يرونها لم يلبثوا إلا عشية أو ضحاها once they would write this either they would write this uh, sometimes on paper and they would tie it onto a woman's arm or they would write this on a bowl with some water and then they would give, give the water to the woman to drink and this would be the most easiest thing for that woman, the most easiest um, delivery of, of a child for that woman. Once a child has been born, we give the adhan and we give the iqama, the adhan in the right ear and the, and the iqama in the left ear. Now, some ahadith suggest that you give two adhans, one in the right ear and one in the left ear. Um, and some ahadith suggest that you give one adhan. Uh, some ulama say that when, he, when the Prophet ﷺ, when the Sahab mentioned there's two adhans, the second one meant iqama, because you can call iqama an adhan. Um, this is a hadith of uh, Ahmad and also Tirmidhi, azana fi uzun al Hasan ibn Ali, hina walada su Fatima. Uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, he gave the adhan in the ear of Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. In another hadith we find uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has been reported to have been seen to give fi uh, uzunay al Hasan in both the ears of Hassan radiallahu anhu, he gave uh, an adhan. Um, and the ulama have, have given their own interpretation. Where we get the adhan and the iqama is from Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah, uh, who was the fifth khalif, or the fifth khulafa, khalifa rashida, a uh, hundred years of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he gave an adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear. The next sunnah after this is tahnik. Tahnik means that you take the child straight away to a person who is pious, and once you hand the child over to this pious person, you take, this pious person will take something sweet, like a date, uh, the, the pious person will then just, just suck onto the end of the date or the sweet, uh, item, and then just to put it onto the mouth of the child, so that the saliva of the child then is, uh, takes in the sweetness of that item, not that he takes that item in, but it's the sweetness of that item, and this is of the, that the barakah of this, this pious person would then uh, be taken into the child and that the child would follow after. The Prophet ﷺ again and again would do this and there are various ahadith, sahih ahadith, if I just, uh, in Muslim and in Bukhari, hannakahu bi tamarah, just to give you one part of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ would do with various uh, children in, in Medina. So wh- why they would do this is that the, when the first, uh, when the first bit that the child takes in his own mouth and in his wrist, in the provision that Allah gives him is from a salih, from a righteous person, then hopefully, inshallah, to follow on this child will also be pious. <coughs> then comes the action of um, aqiqa, uh, to, to sacrifice an animal uh, in the name uh, of the child, uh, well, to, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you, you sacrifice the child and you also do it uh, on behalf of the child. This is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and on this day, which is the seventh day, and I will get get to that in a in a little while, you name the child, you also shave the child's uh, hair, the, the hair on the child. You weight with silver, and whatever weight the child's hair is in silver, you give that much sadaqa in the path of Allah. And I will give you the hadith of each one of these. <coughs> Firstly, to start. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is a hadith in, by Imam Malik, uh, rahimahullah. 
in his Muatta. So wasn't it Sha'ara Hassan that Fatima radiallahu anha, she weighed the hair of Hassan wa Hussein and also Hussein and Umma Kulthum. فَتَصَدَّقَتْ بِزِنَةِ ذَلِكَ فِضَّةً She gave in return of that the weight of silver um, in, in, the Prophet, in the path of Allah. Uh, there are other hadiths to back this up. I'm not going to go into that. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would he would name the child on this day. You can name the child before this. Certain hadiths do suggest that. When you do name the child, please give it the best of names. For we have a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that on the day of judgment, Inna kum tudauna bi asmaikum wa asmai abaikum. On the day of judgment, you will be called by your names, the names of your parents. For ahsinu. So make sure that you, you keep good names for your children so when you're called on the Day of Judgment. Um, the Prophet ﷺ would only change a name when it, the name would contradict an aqidah or a belief of Islam. If the name would not contradict Islam, Islam then the Prophet ﷺ would leave the name. Which means, foreigners came to the country of Medina and to the Arabian country with foreign names, not Arabian names. And the Prophet ﷺ, he kept the name, which means if you name your child with a Western name, even if you name, or if you have a European name, or if you, I mean some people find it's haram, or they say it's makru and so on. There's nothing makru or haram to, to name a child with a European or with a, with a, a, a foreign name, even if it's not Arabic. Though people do say that it's, it's obviously it is better so that you know that this, Mus- this child is a Muslim. I mean, you would, you would ap- appreciate, not only appreciate, you would encourage people to have a Muslim name, that's fine. But why I'm saying this is because there might be chi- times in the future that difficult times might arise. Where just by your name you would face death. Or by your name you might face imprisonment. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would look at a name, he would ask the meaning of the name. If the meaning of the name contradicted Islam and the etiquette of Islam or the base of Islam, he would change the name. For instance, the Sahabi came with the name of Abdul Shams, the, the slave or, or the servant of the sun, like the sun and the moon meaning. And the Prophet ﷺ changed that name and said, your name is Abdul Rahman. Um, but look at Salman. Salman is not a, uh, a Persian name. Salman, he was from Faris. He was for, uh, sorry, he, it's not a Medina name, it's a Persian name. Look at Suhaib. Suhaib was a Roman name. But the Prophet ﷺ kept that name. It's a European name. He did not change the name to anything else. He just kept the name as it was. Bilal was an Abyssinian name. It was not a name of Medina or Makkah. It was not in a dialect. But he kept the name Bilal. Which shows that names can be kept as long as the name does not contradict any of the fundamental beliefs of Islam. Now when you do keep a name, please don't, you have to look at the country and the culture you're also living in. For instance, there is a name called Na'im. Na'im. Which is a beautiful name, it means a fortunate one. But if you keep your child's name Na'im, which means fortunate, in this country they'll pronounce it Na'im. They don't say Na'im, they say Na'im. And then they start taunting, taunting the, uh, the child at, at school by saying, what's your name, name? What's your name, name? And I, I've heard it while I was young as well. I used to think, well, this is an Islamic name, but why is it that this child is being taunted at? Or for instance, there's a, there's a register, or write your name. And he writes his name as name, or the teacher says, write your name again. I say, well, this is my name. Uh, you, you can see, sometimes there might, oh, there, there might be another name. I mean, just, just think. Um, just think, just look at names and see if, if it might resemble a swear word. If it might resemble a, a word that, that is, might, might belittle the child at school or people might find a word that is close to that, uh, word and then to use it to taunt the child. There are plenty of names like this in Arabic and please be careful when you ch- choose your child, uh, child's name to make sure that you have the correct name so that your child will not go through the suffering, uh, throughout his uh, childhood. Um, the the well the, the atika that the Prophet Sallallahu would have would be on the now with the, with regards to the seventh of the eighth the, the seventh day, some ulama have said that the seventh means if your child is born on a Friday, then the seventh is the Thursday. That if you count the Friday to be a day, other ulama have said that if it, if the child is born on a Friday, then you should have the atika on the following Friday. 
So it's complete seven days. It's two different ways of looking at it. And there are certain hadiths to suggest the eighth day, meaning the following Friday, and there are certain hadiths to suggest that it's the seventh day, meaning the coming Thursday, if the child was to be born on, on a, a Friday. So it can be done on any of the days. If you miss that seventh day, then the sunnah is to do it on any seventh day of his life. So the aqiqa, if it's missed at early childhood, you can have it when a child is 12 years old, or no, any age, uh, throughout his, his birth. Now, what do you do at, at, uh, at the aqiqa uh, function? We find in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, this is a sahih hadith of Hakim Abu Dawood Nasai, Imam Ahmad, and also Tirmidhi, where he was once asked about aqiqa, and he said, anil ghulam shatan, when it's a boy, then two sheep, وَعَنِلْ جَارِيَ تِشَاتْ If it's a girl, then it should be one uh, sheep or uh, goat and so on. لَا يَذُرُّكُمْ uh, The Prophet ﷺ stated this. Now, from this you have certain Europeans, the Western, saying, well, why is it when it's a boy, then it's two, and it's a girl, it's one, then you can see there's no equality in Islam and so on. Well, the Prophet ﷺ just suggested this. And this was a practice, but he had also other sunnahs. If you look in the riwayah of Imam Malik, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that whether it's a girl or a boy, it should be shaitan. Two, you sacrifice for them. So again, you don't have to sacrifice one for uh, a girl and two for a boy, you cannot do two. And Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he has a hadith to suggest that you can even sacrifice a bird. Not even, if someone can't afford a sheep, they can just sacrifice a, a bird. And even that can be provided as, as a meal to those who are around. The other one thing is the khitan, which is a circumcision. The Prophet ﷺ, his own sunnah was that on the seventh day, he circumcised Hassan and Hussein uh, radiallahu anhuma. Um, this is a hadith of Bayhaqi. Um, there is also this is hadith Akka Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hassan wa Hussain wa khatana huma li sabati ayyam On the seventh day he, he did both He did the aqiqah and also the circumcision There is also another hadith to suggest that it can be done at a later age But please, especially Bengali families uh, As I do know, they have a very bad custom That they wait till the child is quite old And when I say old, I mean old Sometimes, so, you know, um, it I mean, in this country, it, it ranges from about five years, four, sometimes six, seven, eight. Um, I had a very extreme case when I was in Bangladesh once where I saw a child, not child, I wouldn't call him a child, I'd call him a man actually. He was 19 years old and he had his um, circumcision. And poor, poor guy he had to get married after six months. So you can imagine what he went through. But this is a very bad custom and I don't know why the Bengalis have this custom. Um, why they do this. It, it's completely okay to have the circumcision done at a young age and it's actually painless to have it at that age. The doctors also emphasize it's better to have it at that age and you can see the Prophet ﷺ sunnah as well on the seventh day. Um, now there's one other issue that I need to tackle is the circumcision of women. As we know that's another issue which Westerners point at Islam and say, well why do you as Muslims have circumcision of, of, women, of young girls? In fact, if you look at a hadith, you do not find one hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu says um, that you should circumcise women as well. It's not an Islamic thing, it's a cultural thing which some Muslim countries that have adopted Islam later on have, have kept the custom of circumcising uh, young girls um, as, as well as circumcising boys. Now we have one hadith in Abu Dawood where the Prophet Sallallahu was came across a woman who would circumcise uh, children and he said to her فَقَالَ لَهَا النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَا تَنْهَكِي فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ أَحْضَى لِلْمَرْأَةِ وَأَحَبْ إِلَى الْبَعْلِ The Prophet ﷺ did not say to her, stop and, and uh, don't circumcise um, young girls but he gave her uh, advice and he said لَا تَنْهَكِي When you circumcise young uh, girls don't take off the entire part, but part of it, فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ Because this is more 
uh, it's better for the for, for the girl, and it's also it will be more beloved to the husband later on. Now you can see in this one hadith that exists about the circumcision of girls, the Prophet did not encourage it. In fact, he restricted what the woman was doing already by saying, "Well, these are the guidelines that you should follow." And you don't have any hadith to say that the Prophet said, you know, "Circumcise your daughters as well as your sons." So this is not Islamic. If any person fix this debate about Muslims circumcising uh, young girls, then we just have to say that is, uh, it is cultural, it's nothing to do with Islam. Now, then we have the years of early childhood when the parents have to uh, provide the, the young child uh, and also go through the weaning uh, period uh, to, to breastfeed the child. Um, this is a sunnah of the Prophet and this is a Quranic hukum. I don't know for what reason we have stopped, or oh, many women have stopped, because maybe it's advertisement, maybe it's because government pressure on hospitals and advertising. I mean, the government only spends in a year, um, I think it's one million pounds to advertise for women in this country to uh, breastfeed their, ch- their children, while their advertising companies spend 12 million pounds a year on leaflets and other products to get women to breastfeed, sorry, to, to bottle feed their, ch- their children. And you find most women bottle feed. Now you know, after 30, 40 years, you can see that breast cancer has shot up. And, and the doctors knew this all along. They knew this. It, you know, there's a lot of benefits for the woman and for her child to breastfeed the child up to two years of the child's age. And if they do this, then it, I mean, there's a lot of nourishment. Uh, I mean, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziyyah in his book, book Tuhfatul Mawlud, if you look in his book, he has written a lot about this and said that it increases the love of the child with the mother, it increases the bond, increases the rahma of the mother for the child. It also gives the child natural, um, it, it gives him natural medicine through the, through the suckling of, of this, this milk from the mother against certain diseases that might develop in early childhood. Uh, and it also protects the mother as well. And there's so many benefits. Now, recently, there's been a, a scientific discovery, and everything has to be scientific. I don't know why we have to stop and say, well, science has proved it. Okay, we go ahead. Science says it hasn't been proven yet, yet so stop. I mean, science can't prove everything. I mean, there's some ridiculous things that they're doing tests on. For instance, oh, we've, in the 70s, they're saying, oh, we found that mice like cheese. And that's been tested in laboratories that they like cheese. I mean, so what? People need that in their homes, that you just keep cheese run lying around, mice eat it, so it means they like it, obviously. And I knew, ten years back, that mice like chocolate. They prefer chocolate more than cheese. You leave cheese for a few days, it dries out. You leave chocolate lying around, it doesn't dry out that quickly, and they like that more than cheese. Now, then I find out in 1998, there was a discovery from an American laboratory, in mice like chocolate more than cheese. Well, wow. Now, you've, you've finally reached that stage that you've made an experiment so people will now pull out Mars bars and marathons out. I mean, they don't have to wait for the scientific discovery. There's, there are certain things that are natural. You know them, I mean, if you've tested that, tested that in your own country, then you, you know this natural, uh, so some natural, then go ahead with it. Another benefit of a child, uh, going through breastfeeding is that it is unlikely, now it's not an impossible thing, but it's unlikely that the mother, while she's breastfeeding one child, will give birth to another child while, while that child is still uh, being breastfed. Normally you have in, in traditional countries where they don't use contraceptive methods, you find that uh, there's a gap of two years between each child. Naturally Allah has kept this. Now there's a 90% chance that she won't have a child, but there is a 10% child, uh, chance that she will have a child while uh, the, the, her first child is breastfe- being breastfed. Um, Ibn Sina, who is one of the greatest doctors uh, in our history, he says, عَظِيمُ النَّفْعِ جِدًّا دَفْعُ مَا يُؤْذِي The greatest benefit lies in breastfeeding uh, that will remove uh, the elements inside the woman and also the child that will harm them later on by going through the process of breastfeeding. Now, quickly just to mention this, uh, we know that this country gives child benefit when you have children, but this is uh, found a hadith in uh, Muhammad, in Musannaf Abdul Razak that Umar radiallahu anhu, he used, to, he used to have from his bait mal, he had a portion of wealth given to any woman who would have a child 
at early age he would give them child benefit and this is a sunnah that was uh, stated down from the time of Umar radiallahu anhu onwards. Um, Amr ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu who is a sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gives some advice to his his uh, wife and I just want to quote this to you for women who are breastfeeding their, their children. Um, this is in the book of, by Ma'wurdi in Nasihat al-Muluk Amr ibn Abdullah said to his wife لا يكون أن رضاع رضاعك لولدك كرضاع البهيمة ولدها. So when you breastfeed our child, make sure that it's not like the, the breastfeeding of a normal animal to its own child. قد عطفت عليه من الرحمة بالرحم ولكن أرضعيه. Now there is, a, there is a great bond between this child because he comes from your own womb. Now breastfeed this child تتوخينا ابتغاء ثواب الله by seeking ajr and reward from Allah وأن يحيا برضاعك خلق that by you breastfeeding this child your own خلق and good characteristics will also penetrate through into the child by you breastfeeding the child عسى أن يوحد الله ويعبده maybe this child will um, will become one who will uh, who, who will verify that Allah is one and also worship Him. Now you can see the Sahabi see that breastfeeding will bring the khuluq and the good characteristics of a woman into it, into the child. Moving on from there, one hadith quickly quotes to you: If mothers need to do this, now please, in the Hanafi Madhab, uh, it, it's clear that a woman shouldn't have to do this, but again, if she has to do this, if she has a child and she has to pick the child up because she cannot pray while the child is screaming beside her, um, the Prophet ﷺ did have a sunnah and he did this just to show uh, his ummah that th- these these things can be done, where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, picked the child up um, and then he, he raised the child in his salah and then he will put the salah, uh, he will put the child down. Uh, when, when he would go into Rukur Sujood. This is from a hadith uh, by Ibn al in his in his Kitab al awsaf And he writes with his Sanad that Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet prayed with the Sahabas wa ala unukihi umama ibn tu abil aas. He had a young girl on his on his uh, shoulder. فَإِذَا رَكَعَ وَضَعَهَا When he would go into Rukur, he would put the child onto the ground. وَإِذَا قَامَ حَمَلَهَا When he would come back from sujood, he would then raise the child again. And Imam Shafi rahimahullah, he takes it as dalil. Also Imam Ahmad rahimahullah as well. Now if there are women who are following the Hanafi Madhab, unless you really have to do it, please avoid it. But if you do have to, then it is a rukhsa that you can use of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sunnah. Um, there's a beautiful hadith here um, and you really need to contemplate on this and think well where have we been all these years because every time you have a hyperactive child you think to yourself oh god and then, and then pe- women or maybe mothers or fathers get fed up they can sometimes it can lead them to curse or maybe when they go to a school it can lead the, the teachers to also go to an extent as well Anas radiallahu anhu he reports a hadith from the Prophet Allah and he says that he said Uramatu sabiyyi fi sigharihi ziyadatun fi aqlihi fi kibari The hadith of Hakim al-Tirmidhi Suyuti rahimahullah has said that this is sahih hadith uh, Manawi has also recorded the hadith in Faydul Qadir The Prophet Allah says that a, a child that is, that is hyperactive or violent when, he, when he, the child is in his youth Ziyadatun fi aqlihi fi kibari will become highly intellectual when the child grows up. And if you look at, if you look at hyperactive, I know one or two, in case, I mean, in fact, one of my brothers was hyperactive as well. Now when I see him and he's into this deep thinking, um, if you look at children generally as they grow up and they're hyperactive when they were young, when they grow up, they have ziyadatun fi aqli, as the Prophet says, that it increases their intelligence as they grow up. Maybe you might be able to point to yourself and say, well, yeah, that was me when I was small. Um, moving on from there, the Prophet says that the first, first words that you should teach your children should be, la ilaha illallah. This is a hadith of 
uh, Hakim where the Prophet says Laqinu mawtakum when it, when it comes to death make sure you say La ilaha illallah to the people who are dying and also the people who are at birth or young age say La ilaha illallah to them so that it's the first word that comes out of uh, the mouth a famous hadith of Nawawi if you can please refer to the hadith I'm just going to give you the reference um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would would teach children istihan billah See, what he used to concentrate on children is more than more than ibadah, more than worshipping Allah at an early, early stage the Prophet ﷺ would, would focus on the child's yaqeen and his conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is around and that his dependence on Allah and we have a famous hadith in Imam Nawawi's 40 collections where the Prophet ﷺ takes Ibn Abbas behind him and then he, he says to him, Ya Ghulam, oh child, I'm going to teach you certain words. Ihfadillah. Make sure that you remember these words. And then later on he says to him, Know that if the entire ummah comes, or the entire world or the nation comes to destroy you, and you, Allah wants to save you, then nothing can harm you. And if they want to benefit you, and Allah does not want to benefit you, then nothing can benefit you. The famous hadith, and if you look at the hadith of Rasulullah was building the isti'ana, or the dependency a child should have on Allah, uh, throughout his ages. Another hadith quote to you is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he encourages parents to teach their children uh, Quran, and if they teach the Quran, it is a hadith of Hakim by Buraida radiyallahu anhu who says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Man qara al Quran wa taallama." Whoever reads the Quran and also learns the Quran wa amila bihi and also practices the Quran, ulbisa walidahu yom al qiyamati tajan al nur. Allah will give the parents, the parents of this this child, a a crown on the day of judgment, both a crown uh, on the day of judgment that will be made of light, dauhu mithlu shams, the light of which will resemble the light of the sun. So just to teach your child the Qur'an and for him to learn it and also practice, this is the reward that you will get as parents and you can imagine the reward that your child will get for learning the Qur'an uh, at a young uh, age. When you do teach, the, the Prophet's hadith is to be kind to children when teaching them and to be open and understanding. And this was throughout his seerah of the Prophet which he displayed again and again throughout his life. Quote this hadith to you, then I will move on to uh, another part. فَإِذَا جَاءُكُمْ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa فَإِذَا جَاءُكُمْ فَعَلِّمُوهُمْ وَأَلْطِفُوهُمْ when, when children come to you, then teach them and be kind and affectionate towards them. وَوَصِّعُوا لَهُمْ فِي الْمَجَالِسِ Make space for them where you are sitting. وَأَفْهِمُوهُمْ الْحَدِيثِ And make sure they understand the speech. This is, this is from the Prophet's words, meaning that when you do talk to children, there's another hadith of Prophet where he says, Kallimuhum qadra aqulihim. Not just to children, but to, to men, uh, and people of all levels. When you talk to people, talk to them on the level they understand. Kallimuhum qadra aqulihim. To the extent of their own understanding. Um, talk to them to that, uh, on that level. Anzilun nasa manazilahum. Put people on their own levels. Meaning that, if a child can't understand your sophisticated terms, there's no point of you teaching him in those terms because the child will not be able to understand and then he will turn away uh, from there. I will now move on to a few other things. Now these things that I will say to you, they might not be in exact order, but please, as I say this, I want you to possibly listen to this later on if you can get hold of the recording later on. Listen to this again and again and try and use these principles because each child is different. No child is the same. Just like your own fingerprints are different, your DNA is different. They, 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 in this world, you cannot say that this child is exactly the same as this child. There will be some differences. And the, and the same thing applies when it comes to the methods. When you are trying to control a child, when you say to, an, to a scholar, or when you say to an imam, Imam, how do I control my child? The Imam can only give you principles from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He can't say, well this is your child, let's, let's take it and, and just apply this to him. Because sometimes you have children who are, um, who are very clever when they're young, so they, they will have an independent character. Sometimes children are slow at learning, and slow at grasping things. Sometimes you have children who are more involved in the fun and activities of their daily life. So each child will have a different, you'll have to push, push different buttons. And the two things that you need to use is the Prophet's method of tarheeb and um, targheeb. Targheeb means to encourage, to incite, and tarheeb means to frighten. 
But the Prophet ﷺ would frighten children with umur al-ukhrawi. He would not scare them with his own hadith, but he would relate things to the akhirah, to the next life, to the next world. To say that in, in, in the next life this will happen to a person when he reaches the next life. Or to use targheed, incentives for the child when the child is growing up. In terms of the children as they are growing up, um, the children will test you more than you will test them. Each child, as the child is growing up, we know from, from various uh, ahadiths that the child will continue to find your limits. And you can see this in daily life, whether the child is 3, 4 years old, or 1 or 2 years old, or the child has grown up to 13 and 14. I find as a teacher, a lot, a lot of the times when a new teacher comes, a new person comes, children will go to any extreme to test that teacher to see what they can get away with and what they can't get away with. And they will teach, when it's an old teacher, they will stop. Because they know, well, if I go to that limit, I get detention, I get this, I get that. So therefore, forget that pathway, I'll just give in, I'll just sit down and I'll listen. Now, when the, whenever there's a new person in charge, you will find that the child will test the person to every limit. If you're soft on your grounds, See, one of the main things that I need to give you as a, princi- as a principle is when you explain to a child certain limits, you need to make sure that they have already, before you give them a punishment, if you ever do give a punishment, make sure that the child knew exactly the limits that you have put as a boundary. Never punish a child when a child doesn't know the limits. Or did not know that if he did do this, then he would be punished for it. Never ever punish a child at the first time, because then the child will then be scared to actually develop, or the development will, will stop or cease, because he will be frightened, if I do this, maybe I might be punished. Always allow a child to go through a stage where you, he knows his limits, if he goes beyond that knowingly, then you come about with your punishment. And this is a very basic principle of Islam. If you look at the hudud of Islam, meaning the capital punishment of Islam, um, I, I'm, I'm drawing this because this is the only thing we've got in the Quran to show how Allah deals with His servants. And if we deal exactly how Allah deals with His servants, we will find that we can't go wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says that if you make a, if you make a mistake, then seek forgiveness from me and I will forgive it. Finished. In Islam, there's no such thing as going to your Imam and saying, Imam, Imam, I confess to the sin. In Islam, there's no such thing as going to your parent and saying, Parent, I have to confess to your sin. There's no such thing. If a child re- realizes himself he's done a sin and he does tawbah, leave him alone. Don't even open that chapter. Don't even say to him that I saw you do this when you saw him do tawbah or seek forgiveness from Allah. Leave that, leave that alone. You know that the child has gone through the mistake. I mean, look at your own mistakes. Look how many mistakes we've made. Growing up to 30 to 40, how many mistakes we made as children, how many things we did, uh, creeping behind doors, doing things, parents don't know about it, get away with it. I mean, you know, it, it, it's a moment of having fun. But if, you, if you've been through that yourself, you can't expect to have a child that will be a robot tomorrow in your house, that you will have a remote control and say, well child, bring me this, bring me that, don't do this, don't do that, and he sits like an adult in front of you, a seven year old child, and does exactly what you want, and you'll never get that. Children will, uh, by nature they will run around, by nature they want to have fun and games. So the first thing is, first principle is, if he realizes, or she realizes, that they've made a mistake, and they've done tawbah for it, and teach them what tawbah is, that they should seek forgiveness from Allah straight away. And teach them, that it's more important that they seek the forgiveness of Allah, than they seek your forgiveness. Your forgiveness comes second. A lot of parents, what they do is, when they nurture their children, they make it seem as if they are the one who, who's in the heart. Well, no, put your self on the level of your child. Say to your child that Allah is the one who is looking above me and you. That both of us are responsible for our own actions. That if I do something wrong, I have to answer to Allah. If you do something wrong, you have to answer. Now, I am a person who is being put in charge of you. I have to look over you and see that you don't make mistakes and that I can see, I can try and make you avoid mistakes. But in no way should you make it seem that the authority that you say to a child, don't lie. Don't lie, or the words of don't lie shouldn't come from you. It should come from Allah. Allah says don't lie. Allah is over watching. The Prophet ﷺ says don't lie. The Prophet ﷺ says Muslims are brothers. It's not that be kind to your brother because I say so, I'm your father, listen to me. Because then when the child goes up, it becomes a clash between you and him. Who are you? When he sees you, because you're going to make mistakes, you'll soon slip up. If you're the one who's telling him all these, you're giving this rhetoric in your, in your own house, 
Maybe one day you might make a mistake and the child will point out, well if my father does this, how can my father tell me to do this? And a lot of people grow up doing this. They say, well my father smokes, so my father does this, and he tells me not to be bad. A children can't smoke, or children can't die. The first thing is that you correct your own actions to whatever extent you can. Whatever faults you have, try and keep them far away from your own wife, from your children, never display them. And if ever your children see your mistakes, make sure that you're the first one to say, to explain to them clearly that you're at fault. Never say it's right for you. The minute you say it's okay for you, for adults, and it's not okay for children, that's it. You've broken the main principle, the main law, which means that the child will think, okay, you can get away with it, I don't have to follow it. But if you make Allah the main concern and say, well, Allah is the one who you have to obey, then you're on a par level with your, with your children. The next thing you do, after istighfar and after you understand this principle, the next main principle is, Islam does not want to punish. And why I say that is, it makes it very difficult to punish. If you look at the capital punishment of stealing, to, to, to cut the hand, or to amputate the hand of a thief, you need to have two witnesses that witness this person in the actual act of theft. In the punishment of zina, you have to have four men who have witnessed with their own eyes the actual act of zina. And only when they all four come one by one, taking the oath of Allah, that they've seen the, the scene exact like the pen in the ink pot, when they say that, that will be the, the, uh, the had will then go ahead. Only when four of them, if one backs out, the three will be punished. The person who is accused of will not be punished. Look how, look how difficult Allah has made it for a person to be punished. So basically Allah has made it very, very difficult for a person to be punished or go through capital punishment in Islam. But, if a person goes through that stage where they admit to zina, where they admit to committing theft, or where someone catches them, then Allah says there's no letting off. There's two, two sides. I want you to understand very carefully the two sides. This will, this will Really, this will help you a lot in nurturing and rearing children. The two sides, one is, don't make it easy for you to punish your child. Let him off. When I say let off, I don't mean that he committed the, the act and then you let off. No. When he does something and there's excuse, make, give him an excuse. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Give him the benefit of that. If you think that maybe he didn't mean it, give him the benefit. Carry him doing that. But when you know the day you know your child has done something deliberately, and he has gone beyond the limit, or he has admitted to it. That day, don't be soft. As a parent, hold your heart together, and whatever punishment, when I say punishment, I don't mean by using the stick, I've been through that in the first lecture of this series. When you have to punish the child, or for instance, refrain from the child, showing your anger to the child, be very firm. Make sure that the child knows that you are very upset. Make sure that the child knows that this is it, he's upset, he's made you angry or he's gone to a limit that he shouldn't have. Make sure the child will never ever do that again. The punishment should be something which will hurt the child from within. Not physical hurting, but from his inside, his heart should be hurt by knowing that he's upset his beloved parents and that he has fought the love, the loving relation that he has between him and his parents. And these things, uh, it's important that you have these two things. So please, don't make it easy for you to punish your child and every time say, oh, why do you do that, why do that? Because if you continue to make, make a new punishment every day, or you try and punish the child every single day, then, then you will, you will lose, lose the, the love that you have with the child. A good method that you can use is to have a point scheme in your own house. And I've seen families that have used these and they have change their, the lives of their children dramatically. Point scheme works with children like gold. What you do is anything you want your child to do, any good that you want, I mean, you can buy these points from normal stationery shops, you put a, make a board, uh, put lines through a column and rows where your child, for day to day or maybe a weekly one, where every time they do something good, you, you give them a sticker to go and put on this chart and it encourages them to do more good. And you can, you can, Train a child to do anything, believe me. Make them sit down to read the Quran, make them pray, you can make them even like if they're not, if they're not going to the toilet, or asking them to go to the toilet at an early age, to, to use the toilet instead of, instead of wetting the nappies, you can even use it for that. Very simple things. At the same time, on that point board have a negative theme, which you shouldn't encourage, but sometimes you will use if they're naughty, if they do something wrong, and have a red sticker or something and put it onto the, onto the board, where you show that they've lost points. 
if you can create a competition between them and create a competition only if you feel that competition will work. Some children competition doesn't work. Some children between them uh, competition will just break them down. So please look at the, the family and the children from there move on to see which which thing will work and this is a great great thing you can use with, with children when they're young just to get them to, to pray and, and so on. Um, with some children you have to be more on the guard because like I said, now if you refer to two lectures ago I, I told you about different uh, characteristics different characteristics every child is different and every child will be different from another one child might be excellent, brilliant, you might praise him another child might be hyperactive when you do get the hyperactive child know that Allah says in the Holy Quran إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ فِتْنَةً your children and your wealth is a test for you is a test Allah is testing you, He's testing your patience He's testing to see what you will do, what extent you will go to in bringing this, this child up some things Allah will make easy for them as they grow up sometimes you get a child who will have good characteristics Allah, uh, Prophet Allah says in the hadith of Bukhari sometimes Allah makes it easier for a person to do when they're young for instance, some people for them to be uh, uh, affectionate is easy some people to have good akhlaq and good characteristics good innate qualities is easy for them some people, they're, they're, by nature they're angry a child who's small, by nature is angry now, all you need to do, I remember a child at the age of 13 now all his life, no one had actually controlled his anger anytime he would have a, uh, a clash with children, he would just become angry straight away so, instead of, I mean I didn't punish him at all, I just brought him to my uh, to, to a private place, and I said to him, listen to me, I'm going to tell you that you're difficult, and I want, I want to help you in controlling your anger. And Alhamdulillah, in me just giving him certain ahadith, and telling him next time to control himself, just for him to understand, within one year he had controlled his anger, and was able to get into situations where he wouldn't, he would, his, his veins wouldn't swell up, his, his face wouldn't go red, his fists wouldn't clench, uh, he would be calm and he would then sort the matter out in an amicable way. Another thing you need to understand is that when your child is at early age, their facial features and the, and the lovable face and the cute face sometimes can make you be neglectful of your duty. You think, oh that child is so sweet, I just, I just have to give it to him, I just have to let him off. When you do that, remember please that you're spoiling the child. Each time you do that, the clay is getting harder. Children when they're young, they're soft clay. As the years go by, the, hard, the harder the clay gets. Until when they're 9, 10, 11, 12, the clay starts to get hard, hard. Until the 13, or 12, 13, it gets brittle. It turns hard. Now if you want to change it at 12, 13, a lot of parents come to me and say, uh, can you please take something to my child, please change him, say something it's too difficult sometimes, not all the time, sometimes it's too difficult because the clay has become hard now if you try and change it, you'll break the, the, the shape of that clay has now gone, it, it developed its own shape but if they're young and they try and do something naughty and you feel that they're sweet please, let not the sweetness of a child let, uh, make you spoil the child at early age Another thing I, I, I need to say is that children sometimes are born with certain diseases or they're born with certain um, infections or maybe eczema or something. Again, there are, they are a, a test for you. Um, please, when they're at this stage, don't make statements in front of the child that the child is upsetting you or he's making you, uh, is overburdening you with what you have, the duties that you already have on you that you have to control that, you have to look after his medi you know, these medications and so on please, look at it as a blessing if you have sabr, now remember if you have a child with eczema or something else a child has a disease or something, a rash or something on his body and you do not bear it with patience then you get no reward if you just have sabr, two things patience and ihtisab which is, ihtisab means that you seek reward in, in Allah if you have this, receiving reward in Allah and patience, Allah will give you immense reward. In fact, Allah says in the Holy Quran, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حساب. That the people who have sabr and patience and hold themselves back in this world, Allah will give them their reward without any account on the Day of Judgment.
Okay, the next thing I need to say is that whenever your child, or if your child ever does something of an evil act, always separate the act from the child. Never say, you bad boy, you evil child, you curse Allah, or make, put some description to the child. No, say this is a despicable act. This is an evil act which you need to get rid of. And if you look at the hadith of Bukhari where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sorted out, he sorted out uh, an argument between Bilal radiyallahu anhu and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari in the hadith of Bukhari, where Bilal radiyallahu anhu was, I mean Abu Dhar al-Ghifari he confronted Bilal and in the confrontation Abu Dhar al-Ghifari said to him that you son of a black woman to Bilal radiyallahu anhu. And Bilal radiallahu anhu then reported this to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet came and he said to him, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari said, Inna ka muru'un fi ka jahiliya. You're a man in whom there are still the traits of the jahiliya days, the ignorant days. And then Abu Dhar al-Ghifari with these words, he drew him so back that he put his temple on the ground, his hand on the ground, and he said that until Bilal radiallahu anhu would not put the sole of his foot on, his, on Abu Dhar al-Ghifari's neck, then Abu Dhar al-Ghifari will not raise his head up from the ground. And then Bilal radiallahu anhu said, I forgive Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, and then Abu Dhar al-Ghifari raised his head. But if you look at this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa didn't say, Inna kamru'un jahil. He didn't say that you're a jahili man, or you're an ignorant man. He said, Inna kamru'un fika jahiliya. You're a man in whom there are still the traits of jahiliya. In whom there is the characteristics of jahiliya. Meaning that it's not you, it's your action. You just need to move your action. We're not pointing this at you. And it's very important to do this with children. So that they don't feel that you've got something against them. They feel like, okay, the love is still there as long as I get this, get rid of this, this action. One thing I want you to contemplate on is that why, the reason why we have some we have the same ahadith, the same Qur'an, but yet we have difference in the way our children grow up. The reason for this is our own um, amal, our action. If The more you can practice on the words of the Messenger and the, the words you're preaching, the more effect you will see your words will have on your children and the people you preach to. There's a good book, if you can um, get in terms of nurturing children uh, called Nurture by Nature Nurture by Nature by Paul and Barbara I think that their surname is Tiger it's by like T-I-E-G-E-R I think Allah Alam. Another one thing uh, I want to stress is that when, when children are young you need to use the hereafter or the next life as something which should be embedded in their heart at a young age now please when children listen to what will happen to them after they die. I mean, some children I've seen, they don't know anything about death because their parents haven't told them about death until they're at a, at a later age because they feel the child might be scared, the child might be scared of the grave or something. I mean, the best thing you can do if you feel that the child is scared to give them the lesser of, of the hadith that might scare the child. But still, don't forget that you need to tell the child that everyone's going to die one day. It's a natural thing and that we're, we're on a journey. And the child at a young age, when he can comprehend, he should know that one day he has, he'll be accountable for his own actions. Another one thing we should, uh, a lot of parents make, make uh, a mistake in is that when you do talk about Allah and you talk about the Akhirah, please don't talk about the horrible side of Akhirah. If you don't pray, you're going to hell. If you don't do this, it's going to happen to you. Allah will punish you, whip you, lash you, throw you in hell, turn you upside down, you burn 70,000 years in front of Allah. Why would the child pray after that? He would pray out of fear of Allah. Now, we've got a whole generation of people who have grown up to fear Allah. They only come to the mosque because Allah will get them on the day of judgment if they don't pray. They only come to Allah fearful, scared of Him, uh, just about asking for something. No, but this is only one side of Allah. This is only the Jalaliya of Allah. I mean, He has another whole side of Jamaliya, of intimacy, of closeness, of love, of affection. He's our Rahim, He's most, uh, he's, uh, most merciful and so on. Teach the child first that Allah will love him more than anything else. Allah will give him anything he wants to be praised. Allah will raise his ranks in the next life. Allah will give him this, give him that and encourage. And one of the best things I find in young children, because they have a, an imaginative mind, is when you've given the Akhirah and you've explained this will happen on the day of judgment and hell and so on, then when you get to the Jannah or the, the path of paradise, let the imagination just, just, just roam. Let it become free, set it free. Like a Sahabi came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Messenger of Allah, uh, 
uh, will I have a red camel in, uh, in paradise? Aliya humurun na'im fil jannah. Can I have a red camel? Because the red camel today was like a Ferrari today. You have a red Ferrari today because you can have a normal car and a red, red Ferrari. To them a red camel was the best camel. It was the fastest camel. It was the best camel. It could go in the desert the longest. So he came and said, Messiah of Allah, will I get a red camel? And the Prophet knew, of course, that if no one has ever seen what's in paradise, if no one has ever heard what's in paradise, never, no one can ever think of what's in paradise, obviously there is no red camel in paradise. But he did not stop his imagination. He said, if you wish for a red camel in paradise, you will get a red camel in paradise. Meaning that, okay, right now, you can use this as an incentive. The man will go away thinking, excellent. If I pray to Allah, I've got my red camel in paradise. I've got all my red camels I want in paradise. You use it for an incentive. But when he gets to Jannah, he'll have something obviously thousand or million times better than his own imagination or his, what red camel meant to him in this world. Now use the same tactic with children. When, when I talk to children about Jannah, I say, if you want you to have a theme park of your own, you can build your own theme park. I say, wow, how big will this theme park be? Well, you can, how big do you think? Oh, big as my garden. Oh, big, bigger than that. Okay, bigger than my own street. Oh, it'll be bigger than your town. Wow! What can we do? Uh, then you say to them, in Jannah you don't have to sleep. Wow, a theme park and you don't have to ever sleep. You can always ride. Can we go on a roller coaster? Can we make our own roller coaster, the biggest one, the biggest in this whole world? You say, yes, we can do. Can we roam around in that roller coaster as long as we want and make it the highest roller coaster we ever, ever had? Say, yes, you can. Let his imagination roam. Some of them ask me, can I have PlayStation 10, so I said, then you can have PlayStation 100. Wow, PlayStation 100, can you imagine? Then they start talking amongst themselves. And then I say, well, in fact, in Jannah, you can actually become the characteristics of, or the characters of PlayStation. You can actually be the people in PlayStation. You can play for real. Really? Will we ever get hurt in paradise? No. Then one begins to say, wow, when I see you in Jannah, I'm going to throw you from a mountain. And you're going to bounce up on the floor, get back up, and then you're going to throw me off. And, and they, they carry on. But the incentive then remains, that they, they can then imagine what they want in paradise, and you can get them to pray or do, to do anything else, just through this. One of the greatest problems we have in our time is that parents themselves are not educated to educate their children. It's one of the biggest problems. If you don't know about Islam, how will you teach a child Islam? If you don't know Islam, how do you expect just the mullah or the person who's teaching in a mosque who has two hours and he has 30 children in one class, divide that time, two hours and 30 children, with the time it takes them to come in, to go out, the time it takes for him to quieten everyone down, the time for them to move from one place to another, he can only listen to them twice, which is only five minutes possibly, or maybe four minutes or three minutes for each child if you squeeze that time and if you look at that time. Now how can you expect a man to teach 30 children, and again there's a problem of mosque where they give too many children in one class. How can he teach the entire religion and make them the perfect children when they're only spending one twelfth of their day with him? You don't know anything about Islam and you're not teaching them. You need to be their first teacher. Uh, at school, I, I teach at a school and I find that any child that comes to the, to the school with good characteristics, you look at the parents and the parents are practicing. The child, the, the children that are not prepared at all Islamically, you find that the parents are not prepared themselves. They don't know about Islam and it's, it's a big, big danger of this society where if you don't know about Islam, how will you teach your children about Islam? And this is something you need to think about. When you, and now this can develop, that when you have a child, you sometimes you want to joke around with the child. When you joke around with the child, please don't hurt the child. Don't hurt the child. You can joke around, it's the sunnah of the Prophet as I quoted to you earlier today, that you can joke around, laugh with the child. It's good, it's fun, it's ed- education. But at the same time, remember not to hurt the child. Don't give him a name or a nickname he doesn't like. And with this you tease him, and he gets a bit upset, and before he cries you, you then calm him down, soothe him down, you simmer in and you carry on. This is something which will break the child eventually. Um, sometimes please conceal the, the fault, especially with other children. If your one child has done something wrong, try not to make it public in front of the entire family. Unless you're using it as a deterrent. Unless you're trying to scare all the other children that look, if you do this, you, you'll end up like him. Unless you're doing this, Try and talk to children privately and the best method that you, you, you can use, and I've tried it myself with children, is call a child, if the child is doing something wrong, 
whisper something in his ear. Hey, look, this is a secret between me and you. I've seen you do this. I know you're up to this. But look, I'm not going to tell your mother. I'm not going to tell the other brothers and sisters of yours. I'm just going to leave it between you and me. And let's see if you can stop this. And children love this. And this, as I quoted you last month, the Prophet last month also used this as a method when he, um, when he whispered to a child's ear once and he got him to listen to exactly what he, he wanted. Um, as children are growing up, you will find um, they need to pray and in, in, this, in this country you have a problem with prayer sometimes um, where, where you have the Isha and the Maghrib very close you have the Fajr very early now obviously you need to get them to wake up at Fajr time early in the morning with yourself, not just them saying that get up in the morning and you're snoring away and sometimes you do get good cases where children are waking up their parents for Fajr and it's good, Alhamdulillah, at least they're on their toes as well but you get, you have a problem in this country, especially in summertime with Isha and Maghrib being very close. Now, if you find it difficult that you need them to sleep and also to get good rest um, for the morning, um, take a photo, now this is only for children who are young. When I say young, I mean the maximum is age of 10. Maximum is age of 10, because up to the age of 10 there are a lot of things that we can let them off with. Um, you can give them the 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 khuruqsa um, as a child to say say that they can combine the prayers as I've taken this fatwa of Mufti Barakatullah in Finchley where he gives children who are young the, the fatwa that they pray Maghrib and they pray Isha straight away as well and then they go to sleep it's better than they it's better than them praying waiting for Isha and either dropping off not praying Isha or they pray Isha late and then in the morning they don't pray Fajr or they can't get up for Fajr or they have uh, other difficulties so you can have that rukhsa. If you do ever make, um, if you do ever find that there's a personality clash between you and your child, please, the first thing that you need to do is to make sure that it does not lead to you two breaking up. Sometimes this can happen. Your child can be the total opposite of yourself. It's going to be quite shocking to some parents. You like, you know, you're a person who, who's in your direction, he's in total opposite direction. Please remember the Prophet of Allah said, Al Arwahu Junudu Mujannada. Souls are like marshaled troops in Sahih Hadith of Bukhari. Sama Ta'arafat Minha Sama the Prophet of says that whatever is similar for of one person to another person, they will get close to one another. Wama Tana Karat Minha Ikhtalaf. Whatever difference is is the, a, char, a person finds of another person of the personality type then you will find that ikhtalafa they will move in different directions now when your child moves in a different direction look at what is best for your child in his education don't make him a doctor because you wanted to become a doctor you couldn't become a doctor you failed to become a doctor and because you failed now you want your child to become a doctor when he's line is in sports or his line is in something else in, in some other field because you will just break your child eventually can you imagine a child who grows up he's become a doctor, doctor because his father said to become a doctor and he doesn't like to become a doctor would you like that doctor be, to be your GP he doesn't like his job when he has to do his job and he's treating you now please when your child grows up, every I, I'm not, I'm not, I know a lot of pa- parents want to have their child become a hafiz, to become a alim, a scholar, to become uh, either a doctor, engineer, all these things are good. And as long as you're doing it for the sake of Allah, all these things are rewarding. Even to make your child an engineer or something is rewarding. Just have the intention of pleasing Allah and it, you will get reward for it. But remember, let the child develop best at what he's good at. I, I knew a child in Madrasa, when I was in Madrasa, in the first two years, he wanted to become a builder. He wanted, he was, when you put him up to building work or plumbing, he would make, he would do the best job you could, you've ever seen. Better than what adults do. But when he was up with books, he didn't like to read books. He wasn't into reading books. And his father put him on a pathway of him becoming a scholar. Now his father did that for six, seven years. Eventually the child broke, broke down. And he just didn't want to read. He just didn't want to go. And now he's a professional plumber. He chose his own profession, he went down, and he's become the best in his own field. If you do find that with the child, I mean, do try and test and see if you can make him in a direction you want to. But the minute you see that 
he's not good at what he's doing, the, the path that you're putting him at, please turn away. Find the best thing he's good at and uh, let him move in that direction at an early age. Do you remember that from an early age you, you can become the cause of jealousy between your children? Never compare one child to another child and say, well, look at your brother, look how good he is, look how good he, he is or she is, and look how dumb you are, look how damn you are, look at this, look at yourself. Because first thing is that he will then, his development will stop. And second thing, you'll cause jealousy between him and his other brother. We have stories in the Quran between Yusuf and his brothers, they, they had jealousy. In the end, they put him into a well. And luckily Allah saved him, but you could have imagined what would have happened to him if he had stayed there. Um, and you have another story of Habil and Qabil in the six years of the Holy Quran, Ain and Cable, where you have, again, jealousy between the two brothers caused one to kill another. Um, one other thing is, please respect your children from young for them to respect you and show a good, if you talk in full sentences, your children will talk in full sentences. If you talk with adab and akhlaq and with please and thank you, your children will also grow in that manner. If they see you swearing, if they hear you swearing, the first thing a child will do is pick that up. And they will use that amongst one another when it comes to their own arguments between one another. And you're the one who taught them. Not anyone else. You'll be the one who would have taught them this. Um, with regards to keeping ties, please emphasize to the child and within your family that you keep your ties with the brothers and with the sisters, with your family relationships from an early age before they reach a later age. And this will encourage them to stay together at a later age. With regards to, what one thing I need to say really important is a lot, of, a lot of parents sometimes are deceived by their children because their children lead double lives. And I've caught a lot, a lot of children myself in this. They lead double lives. When they're at school, they have one life. When they're, when they're home, they have a different life. When they're home, they're good, they're very caring, they're affectionate, they have good akhlaq. When they're at school, they, they go to limits in being with their friends. And please remember that friends are a, a great influence on, on children. If you have, if they have bad company, they will turn to bad, uh, into a bad um, pathway. And I've given you the hadith before, time and again, of the Prophet Allah giving the, the hadith of resemblance of a good companionship and a bad companionship, where he says, good companionship is like kahamil in miski, like a, one who carries perfume with him. Imma an yu'atiyaka, either he will give you the perfume, or either, if he, if he doesn't give you the perfume, or yabta anka, either he will sell you the perfume or you will at least smell good fragrance from him throughout the day and a companionship of, of a bad companionship is like a person who is like a blacksmith who blows uh, air into fire and he, he melts down um, iron um, either either he will burn your clothes or you will, you will find a bad odor coming from him and that's the same thing with when your children are at school or any company you need to find first who he or she is staying with they stay with children with bad characteristics that will rub off on them they stay with children with good characteristics that will also rub off on them but the important thing I need to say is about double lives sometimes just because the child says to the parents you know my daddy or mother, I'll never lie to you I, I can do anything else, but I'll never lie to you. And the parents feel so prestigious, and they, they think, oh, my child is so, so honest, he'll never lie. Yet he goes to school, or he goes outside, and he's lying 50 times every day. And the parents never catch him out, or never crosses. The two lives never cross. Until the day they don't cross, the parents never find out. And it can be very disastrous the day, the day they do find out. And please, one other thing most important would be, that I haven't yet mentioned, but it is very important, it's about television and certain games or, or things that they watch. Even in PlayStation and other games that you have now, you have 18 rated games. But parents don't even see this. They give their children or 7, 8, 12 years old games that are 18 rated. Now in these games you have pornography, in these games you have crime, you have shootings, you have killing or you have beating up. Now every child, when a child plays this game or sees this film, will just not go out and just beat his, child, beat his brother. But you will find that some children will do this. They will imitate. Children love imitating. If you don't control what they're playing or what they're watching, I mean, I don't want to say to you that throw out the TV or throw out the PlayStation because if you do throw out the TV, you will find the child will go to your next door neighbor's house He'll go to his friend's house and he'll be sitting there and watching and it's better that he sits with you and watches than to go to a different person's house and watch. And with regards to 
uh, PlayStation, I mean, it's better that he plays in your house than to go to a ch- fish and chip shop or to go to an arcade uh, play, p- place where he goes to uh, with his friends and he plays over there. But please do control what he plays and what he watches. And lo- a lot of this can have effect on him if you don't be careful. And two more things I just want to mention before I finish this. One thing is that um, when you rear up your children, don't make a black and white Islam to them. Don't say this is haram or halal. Do leave things in between by saying it's makru or you shouldn't do this or it's bad to do And give him reasons. Children love having reasons. They always ask why. Why is haram? Why is it? Give them the benefits or the disadvantages of doing certain things in terms of, of children and, the, and schools. If you can, please get into local um, school governing bodies and try and change the curriculum of the school, of the school in terms of collective worship when they when they do worship together in school, whether it's a Christian dominated worshiping um, assembly they have uh, again uh, with their dress, with their diet, with their hijab as well. Young girls need to be told about hijab at an early age. Try and encourage this by you getting into becoming a Muslim governor or part of a school governing body and you you will have li- you liaise with the Department of Education or the Home Office or the London Education Authority or with the Commission for Racial Equality. Please look into this as parents. Don't leave it to other people, other Christians and Jews to get inside there and then for them to dictate what will happen to your children. Please be active in your own society, in your own place. If you can do homeschooling and if you can uh, teach uh, children at home, it's the best thing you can do. It will take a lot of effort. If you can, in a mosque, teach them, uh, start a school in a mosque, it's far better than you teaching them at, at school. But you have to have uh, qualified teachers at the school, uh, at the mosque, which you can do. And the last thing that I wanted to say to you is the dua. Please don't forget, dua is most important for your children. Every time, bless them. Hold them in your hands. Do dua for them. Give them dua on their face and behind their back in the depths of the night and never ever curse them. Because your dua will go into, to, towards the skies or your curse will go towards the sky like an arrow that has nothing in its way. Jazakumullah wa akhi da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just to mention a few things that will influence a child as the child goes through school. In the early years of nursery, the particular rhymes that the child will utter every day will have an effect on his aqidah and on his beliefs and the identity of the child will be formed at this stage by looking at the surrounding environment in the school particularly at the, pe- at the teachers or the peers that are around the child will then face in the later stages of school going up to secondary school slowly this will or some of these things will have effect there will be pressure of peers at school there will be also the kind of feeling the child will have of whether the child wants to be known as a Muslim or not and it will be important for me to mention here that Jews raise up their children making them feel very proud that they are Jews another one thing that will influence the children throughout school age is the tendency of a culture of arrogance that has crept into the schools of impatience of challenging authority uh, and it is strange that this kind of culture is stamped out of children at an early stage in private schools and one needs to ask why then is it allowed to continue in state schools another one thing that will influence children is imitating stars that he will see on uh, the movies or he will see in his life as as characters that will shift his mode of thinking. Another one thing that will influence him is the fast-moving technology that gives him a sense of the upper hand over the elders, that elders are old-fashioned and that children are ahead of them in this new society. Another influencing factor will be that that the child will see immoral behavior in the school, free mixing in in particular outdoor activities or physical education with free mixing, uh, will also have an effect on the child.
A child does not need to know the secrets of life at an early age and this, by knowing this, the child will move into the area of inquiring or being inquisitive of what there is to be hidden and this can be a dangerous element to be given to a child at an early age. Television also or the seeing of pictures also will influence a child and for this I will ask you to refer to my uh, lecture on influence of the television. Just to mention that the internet, the, the, the television, the satellite or console games or staying outdoors or using mp3s or mobiles all create a sense of individualism inside the child and moving away from parents, moving away from elders and parents should not encourage this uh, just to get the children out of their sight uh, or to use these or some, some of these as babysitters um, especially with the internet or the mobile phones children can be in contact with anyone at any time uh, especially with non-mahrams or those that they shouldn't be in contact with, other boys, other boys or other girls, um, or dangerous people out there. So parents need to watch out. May Allah protect all of us. Amin. Jazakumullah khair. Wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.